what you need to enable and allow space for is the opportunity to trial, experiment, and do new things, and give the team again permission to fail and say quite frankly, like, look, this might not work, and that's completely fine. But if you're not winning, you're learning. And so if it doesn't work, we'll at least know what doesn't work and we can learn and benefit from that. So the couple of things which are absolutely critical for every business to have with when ensuring sales success is number one, the recruitment process of sales people. You can't sell if you don't have the right people. And so therefore what you have to ensure is you have the best people coming in. So a robust talent acquisition process and talent assessment process is absolutely key. The second thing which is critically important is having a repeatable selling system. Rather than having lots of salespeople doing their own thing and everyone reinventing the wheel, this is the way that we sell, this is the way that we win, and have it so that it's systematized for everyone to be able to easily follow. The third thing that you've got to have, which is absolutely critical, is a tight, tight, tight grip on the numbers. So what is the average deal size? What is the average deal lag? What is the, the flow of leads per month? What are the standard conversion rates? Once you have that, you can then build a model and build a team around it. And you know if you're up and you know if you're down and you know where you need to intervene. So those three things, killer recruitment process, an excellent way of being able to uh, repeat the sales system, and then finally have the right numbers. The biggest pitfall within sales is people thinking that sales is just about relationships. It gets oversimplified and therefore doesn't get the time, effort, and attention that it deserves in order to create greatness. So when looking at reducing it down to just being about relationships, the things that get lost is the consultative component, the effectiveness of asking great questions, the effectiveness of providing a great solution, the effectiveness of pricing strategy, the effectiveness of touch points within communication and consistently following up. It all gets reduced down to, it's just about relationships. Um, and while that's missed, what it means is that there's then a, a lack of accountability on the other activities that should be taking place. There's a lack of coaching on those other ac activities that should be taking place. And therefore, as an output, what you get is a, a drop in results. And that creates a big disparity between those salespeople that are good and just have a little bit of charisma and those that are great and consistently provide excellent so solutions to problems and get great results for clients. So I'd say that's the biggest one. If I was to chuck in a second one, it would really be around having sales managers sell. One of the things which is really common is trying to have, trying to maximize resource. And that's an understandable thing, but it's counterintuitive when you have a sales manager also selling because when a sales or the role of a sales manager is to multiply the output of the team that sits beneath them, they can either multiply or they can add. If they're managing the team, coaching them, holding them accountable, motivating them, managing the pipeline, that's multiplying the output of everyone else beneath them. However, if they're individually selling as an individual contributor, they're just adding to the number. And while that might be a good thing in the short term, it might help you hit your month target. It might help you even hit your quarter target. What it won't do is help you hit the full year target and continue to grow substantially over the course of years to come. And so as a result of that, what ends up happening is sales teams end up running on a treadmill, never really getting much further than a couple of inches because they're maximized on resource. When looking at a sales playbook, you really want to look at three initial things when determining what is it that should go into it. And then I'll share the what's in ours. So the first thing that you want to look at is what are the outcomes that you're trying to achieve? And when I say outcomes, that's not just revenue. It might be that you're trying to maximize for conversion rate. You're trying to maximize for average deal size, deal lag, whatever it might be, be really, really clear as to what is the measure that we're trying to drive. After that, it's then a case of high payoff activities or HPAs. What are the activities during the sales process that have a disproportionate or an 80-20 impact on the sales process? 
And then finally, looking at leakage. And this is when you're looking at the sales stages within the sales process, where is it that we're losing the majority of opportunities? Across those three things, if you extract the key insights, what you then get is, okay, this is where we should be focusing on when building our sales playbook. Because what you don't wanna do is just create lots of information for the sake of information's sake. And so therefore, by focusing on those key things, you're effectively focusing on the most sensitive nerve. So as then to what's in our sales playbook, we took a very similar approach in as much as looking at the outcomes, high payoff activities and leakage. And then we've built out four primary chapters. The first one is what we call proposition. And within this, you have key information around who is it that we're selling to and what is it that we're selling? What are the critical things that we need to know about these markets, these type of ideal customer profiles, the way that they buy, things that trigger them? And then the same thing again, but from our products and services. So that's proposition. The second chapter is around sales process. So this is the, the meat and potatoes of the sales playbook, the how behind the selling. And for this, what we're looking at is for each of the different stages within your sales process. And that could include prospecting through to discovery, through to solution creation, so on and so forth. What are all of the different steps? And then what are the hows that sit behind them? So the marker of a great sales playbook is one which somebody could come off the street into your business, look at that and go, okay, I get it. I know exactly what I need to be doing for each of these different steps and stages. That's the second one. The third one is then what we call foundations. And foundations is all of the things that are really important within a sales function, but aren't at the tip end of the selling spear. So things such as how to use the CRM, how do we use sequences and automations? What are the, the KPIs and key measures? How do commissions work? All the things that are really important within the sales function, but aren't part of the, the core sales process. The fourth part, which is then critically important, is the sales manager's playbook. So this is how is it that we're holding the team accountable? How is it that we're coaching? How is it we're motivating? How is the compensation structure set up? So on and so forth. So you can ultimately ensure that when building out this function and when the team are operating, they're operating at the highest possible level. This is probably one of the hardest things to create because it's not a tick box exercise. It's not a, a module that you're creating or just a deliverable that you're creating. It's a cultural shift. So there's a couple of different components to the answer. But the first one is that it has to start from the top in as much as whatever it is that happens at the top within the C-suite, within management, within leadership, that's going to be what cascades down and what gets seen as that's the way that we do things around here. And I'll give you an example just to make it a little bit more tangible. If it's the case that when people make mistakes or they slip up or they, they took a bet and it didn't quite pay off, what happens and how does that get treated? If it gets treated in a way of, well, you messed up, that's on your that's on your shoulders, you're gonna be penalized for it, then that type of thinking just won't take place. And instead what will get bred will be a, a culture of finger pointing. But when we're looking at a growth mindset, that's a mindset of um, rather than these are my limitations, this is the beginning and this is what's possible. It's always the beginning rather than the end. And so if you look at that on a wider company scale, does the company make bets? And, you know, with the nature of it being a bet, it's not always going to pay off. And when, let's say, the CEO or the CRO fails at something that they've done, is that something that gets tucked in a corner and not spoken about? Or is that something that gets owned and seen as a, an opportunity for further development? Because whatever it is that happens there, that's going to be what everyone else within the organization sees. The, the second thing which is really important with having a growth mindset is the the encouragement of the sales team to try new things. And this is almost counter to having the sales playbook, which is the repeatable selling system. This is the way that we do things. But what you need to enable and allow space for is the opportunity to trial, experiment and do new things and give the team again permission to fail and say quite frankly, like, look, this might not work and that's completely fine. But if you're not winning, you're learning. 
And so if it doesn't work, we'll at least know what doesn't work and we can learn and benefit from that. But if that's not something which is set as something which is acceptable for the team, then it's just never going to happen. And equally, if it's not something which is acted out upon at the leadership level, it's not going to be imitated at a more junior level. So they're really the two key things that enable a growth minded culture to to take place. And that's not just within sales, that's within other teams, too. But it's just particularly important that it does happen with sales. Otherwise, the the thinking and the strategies never go above and beyond that which the manager or the leader sets out. Whereas what you want is to have a groundswell of support and activity rather than just acting out on whatever it is that's been briefed by the leader. The biggest trend would probably be with the biggest buzzword, and that would of course have to be AI. Um, let me put some meat on the bone as to what that looks like and pros and cons and what's being used well as well as where are the pitfalls. Naturally, with something as powerful as AI and as shiny and new as AI, everyone jumps on the bandwagon. And there's almost a, a perception that AI has a, a the Midas touch. You use it and therefore it equals greatness. Whereas that is very, very, very much not the case. It, enables a little bit of a shortcut in as much as you can draft emails far better, far quicker. You can create scripts really, really quickly. But equally, people are smart and people are very sensitive to uh, communication. And so if you receive an email that's been written by AI, chat GPT, whatever it might be, nine times out of 10, you'll smoke it out pretty quickly and it will get immediately discarded. But it makes the salesperson's job a little bit easier and therefore there's a lot of it that's being pumped out so it has incredible potential and in ways of being used but you don't want the dial to go too far because what that it it overcorrects it's it's almost too good for its own good um then ends up generating bad results where i have seen it used incredibly well though is within sales strategy. So let's take, for example, you might have a complex B2B um, sale that's taking place, complex B2B deal, and you could be working with multiple decision makers and there's an extended decision-making process that's taking place, budgetary approvals required, all of this good stuff. Put that information into ChatGPT and say, this is what I'm working with. This is my product. This is what the competitive landscape looks like. What would you do next? And using it almost as like a, an advisor or a sparring partner, that works really, really well. The other thing, which is a big trend at the moment, and this somewhat links back to what I was saying earlier, is the market is tight at the moment. The market is tough at the moment. And what does that mean? That means that companies are trying to do more with less. And the way that manifests in sales teams is the the breadth of salespeople's roles. So where historically a salesperson might have just been inbound, so just taking opportunities that are coming in, it's then a case of, ah, all right, well, leads are drying up. You've now got to go outbound. So it's more of a 360 role, an expansion of that. And quite often the person who's good at going outbound and being the hunter is not the person that's also inbound and being the farmer two different people. So there's trying to do more with less and that comes with a lot of challenges. And then equally, whilst trying to maximize resource, it's also back to the sales manager who's also selling. We need to tighten our belt a little bit and therefore sales manager, you now also need to be hitting the road, hitting the phones, jumping on the calls in order to close deals. And the challenging thing with that is that whilst it might be good in the short term, Quite often the sales manager, the sales leaders are good at selling and they have the credentials, they have the background. And so what ends up happening is then they just get pulled further and further and further into that world. But there is a very real medium to long term opportunity cost that's taking place. And that is, well, it's the expense of multiplying the output of the wider team and being able to rebuild that wider team. And so, again, whilst you might be hitting the, the monthly number or perhaps even the quarterly, there's a big trade-off that's taking place further down the line. So something to be really cautious of whilst people are trying to do more with less and tighten the belts a little bit. It's a fine, it's a fine balance between the two, but it's certainly an important one to, 
to strike and to go into eyes wide open.